Now, we are going to study today uh, the importance of literary structure in the study of the millennium. This is just an example of the importance of seeing the sequence of events in the book of Revelation, and I would say Daniel also needs to be examined very carefully in the light of its structure. So let's go to our material that was given out, and the first thing that we want to do is ask several questions about the millennial passage in Revelation chapter 20. We have studied that it is important when we're studying a passage of Scripture, particularly prophecy, to ask the passage questions. So let's ask a few questions about the millennial passage. First of all, why does the lake of fire appear three times in Revelation 20 verse 1 through 21 verse 8? Are there three lakes of fire? Or is it perhaps true that Revelation 20 verse 1 through 21 verse 8 runs in cycles, repetitive cycles? We're going to take a look at that. The next question, why does the city appear to be on earth in one passage when the wicked surround it, and in another passage the wicked seem to be destroyed before the city descends? Another question, in Revelation 20 verse 12, we are told that the dead stand before God. The question is, how can dead people stand in the presence of God? And the final question we want to ask, and as we go along we're going to ask more questions by the way, why do we get the impression from Revelation 20 verse 5 that the wicked will resurrect in the first resurrection? You know, when you read that verse, it gives the impression that the wicked are going to resurrect in the first resurrection. But there's another previous verse that says that the righteous will resurrect in the first resurrection. So how do we resolve that particular problem? Well, first of all, let's make some introductory remarks, and we will do it by asking another series of questions. Will the millennium be spent in heaven, or will it be spent on earth? What will be the condition of the earth during the millennium? What will God's people be doing during the millennial period? Why is there a white throne judgment after the millennium? What does Revelation mean when it speaks about the second death? What is meant by the binding and unbinding of Satan? And finally, is it even important to know what will happen during this time? Those are the main questions that we are going to try and answer as we study about the millennium. Now in the handout that you've received there's uh, some blanks that you have to fill in, and so this is done kind of like in question and answer form, so you're going to help me this morning in our uh, study. Now Revelation 19 verses 11 to 21 describes the second coming of Jesus. You've read that passage, right? Jesus is sitting on a white horse, the armies of heaven are coming with Jesus, He comes to trample the winepress, you know, and to destroy the dragon, the beast, and also the kings of the earth. So it's describing the second coming. Now, by this time, the plagues will have decimated the population of the planet. In other words, the plagues will destroy most of the inhabitants of the earth. So the question is, what happens at the very culmination of the second coming of Jesus? And we have the answer in Revelation 19 verse 21. It says, and the rest, that is those who survived the plagues, the rest were what? Were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of Him who sat on the throne. So the question is, how many of the wicked will be destroyed by the plagues and by the second coming of Christ? Every single one. When Jesus comes on the clouds, the rest will be slain. Many will be slain by the seven last plagues. Now, let's read the note. The millennium is described in Revelation 20 verse 1 through Revelation 21 and verse 8. That's the millennial passage. And actually, <coughs> It, uh, we're going to notice that chapter 21 and verses 2 through 8 uh, really should be included with the millennial passage even though it's in chapter 21 and not in chapter 20. 
Now the events in these chapters are not in strict chronological order, but they run in cycles. In other words, we know this because the identical climax is reached four times. Though the events are repeated four times, each repetition has a different center of focus or emphasis. Are you understanding this point? In other words, Revelation 20 verse 1 through 21 verse 8 repeats the same material four times. You can't read it in linear fashion. You can't say, okay, I'm, I want to know what happens before, during, and after the millennium, so I'm going to start in Revelation 20 verse 1 and it's going to give me the strict chronological sequence through chapter 21 and verse 8. It won't work because it goes back and forth. You have four repetitive cycles, kind of like Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and 9, and Daniel 10 through 12. In other words, you repeat the same material four times, but each time it has a different emphasis. Now the question is, what are the four repetitive cycles? You have them summarized at the bottom of page 1. Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3 describes the events before, during, and after the millennium, and the center of focus is Satan and the condition of the earth. That is the central focus of those verses, chapter 20 and verses 1 to 3. The emphasis once again is Satan and what the condition of the earth will be. The second uh, cycle in Revelation chapter 20 is uh, found in verses 4 through 10. And the center of focus in Revelation 20 verses 4 through 10 is upon the saints, upon God's people. What happens with God's people before, during, and after the millennium? So you have the first cycle, the emphasis is upon Satan and the condition of the earth. The second cycle is upon what happens with God's people before, during, and after the millennium. The third cycle is found in Revelation 20 verse 11 through chapter 21 and verse 1. And the center of focus there is upon the wicked. In other words, the center of focus is what happens with the wicked before, during, and after the millennium. And then finally, the fourth cycle in the millennium passage is found in Re Revelation 21 and verses 2 through 8, where the center of focus is what life will be like in the holy city and what will happen to the wicked finally. So there are four centers of focus in this millennial passage. And unless you, you understand the structure, you're, you're, not, you're going to misplace events. And so the first cycle, the emphasis is Satan and the earth. The set, second center is the saints. The third center of focus is the wicked. And the last center of focus is upon the holy city. So let's go to our first cycle on page 2 and notice how Revelation 20, 1 through 3 emphasizes the condition of the earth and what will happen with Satan specifically. We have several blank spaces, so you're going to help me answer this. The angel who comes down from heaven has the key to the bottomless pit. Now this is not the best translation, bottomless pit. It actually translates one Greek word, uh, it's the Greek word abusos, and the word that we get in English from abusos is the abyss. It's translated in Genesis, um, the equivalent Hebrew word in Genesis is translated the deep. So in other words, uh, it says here that an angel comes down from heaven and he has the key to the bottomless pit. Now what is meant by this expression, bottomless pit, or by the abyss, or by the deep? Well, we have to go back to Genesis. In Genesis 1 and verse 2, we are told that the earth was in what condition before God began creation week? The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So the earth was without form and void, and there was darkness over the face of the deep. Now let's read the note, because the note is very significant. The word deep in 
The Greek Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, you've heard of the Septuagint, right? Uh, it's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. The word deep in the Greek Old Testament is the same as the one that is found in Revelation 20 verse 1. Is that significant? So in other, word, in, in other words, in Genesis 1 verse 2, it's the word abusos. So what does the word abusos describe? It describes the earth being empty and in disorder, right? As it says, without form and void. Now, what does without form and void mean? I like the Spanish translation better. It says desordenada y vacía. Disorderly and empty. Void means empty. And so the earth was empty and it was in disorder. So what condition will the earth be in when this angel descends from heaven? It will be just like it was in Genesis before creation week. Now let's continue reading this note. This word describes a planet in a chaotic pre-creative state. It is noteworthy that the plagues of Revelation 16 actually reverse creation and return the earth in some degree to pre-creation chaos. The very things which God made during creation are afflicted by the plagues. The earth is broken up, the sun, moon, and stars are moved out of their places, all the vegetation is destroyed by the intense heat of the sun, the seas are filled with blood, all the fish die, and the planet returns to darkness and all human beings die. Does that sound like a reversal of creation? Absolutely. The plagues reverse creation. So my question is, how can futurists say that this earth is going to be a place where God's people are going to live with Jesus sitting in Jerusalem for a thousand years? Be real. There's no way they could survive. Because the plagues return the earth to the condition it was in before creation, without form and void, disorderly and empty. That will be the condition of the earth. And so when the angel descends there to the bottomless pit or to the abyss or to the deep, he's returning to an earth that is without form and void, like it was before creation week. So now we know what the condition of the earth is going to be like just by reading the word abyss and comparing with Genesis 1 verse 2. Now let's go to our next section. The prophet Jeremiah was permitted to see the earth during the millennium. He heard the sound of the what? Trumpet. Of the trumpet. Uh, is there something in the New Testament about a trumpet, trumpet announcing an important event? When Jesus returns, He returns with the sound of the what? Trumpet. Of the trumpet. And notice, the alarm of what? It, war. Is there any passage in Revelation that speaks about the coming of Jesus being a war? In righteousness He makes war, it says in Revelation chapter 19. So what event is being described here? The second coming of Christ. And then we continue, He then beheld the earth. After the trumpet and the war, He beheld the earth, and indeed it was what? Without form and void. Is the condition going to, is the earth going to return to the same condition it was in before creation? When the trumpet sounds and when this final war takes place? Absolutely. And notice, and the heavens and they had no what? Light. Was there any light at the beginning before creation? No. He also saw that the mountains what? Quaked. Jeremiah beheld and indeed there were lots of men. There was no man. Why? because they're all destroyed by the brightness of His coming. And it says, And all the birds of the heavens had fled. There's no birds. The fruitful land had become a what? Wilderness. A wilderness. And all of the cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by His fierce anger. Are you catching a picture of what this world is going to be like as a result of the plagues and the coming of Jesus? It is going to return to the condition it was in before creation week. Whether the earth was here for millions of years without any life on it, or whether Jesus made the earth and then immediately began creation week, uh, you know that's not the point that we want to cover right now, and it's, as far as I'm concerned it's irrelevant. Because the important thing is how long ago did creation week take place? That's the key. How long ago did creation week take place? 
And we know that it was about 6,000 years ago that the week of creation took place. So the earth will return to the condition it was in before creation week. Now let's read the note. In spite of the incredible desolation caused by the wrath of God, we are told that at this time God would not make a full end. Why does it say that God would not make a full end? Is this the end when the world returns to the condition it was in before creation? Is this the end of all things? Is this the last word? No. There are events that are going to take place after the thousand years, right? So very interesting that Jeremiah would say there in chapter 4 and verse 27 that even though the earth is without form and void, this is not the full end. Now let's go to our next section. In Jeremiah 25, 30 to 38, we have a powerful description of the coming of Jesus. We are told that the Lord will roar from on high and utter His voice from His holy habitation. And by the way, He does utter His voice in Revelation 16 verse 17 at the moment of the seventh plague and in other places in Revelation as well. So we are told that He will roar from on high and utter His voice from His holy habitation. He will give a what? A shout. Can you think of another passage that speaks about a shout? For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the what? And the trumpet of God. See, Jeremiah and Isaiah saw this day. Now let's continue here. He will give a shout as those who tread the what? The grapes. The grapes. Do we find anywhere in the New Testament that speaks about Jesus coming to tread the grapes? Revelation 19, when He comes on the white horse and the armies of heaven come, it says He comes to tread the winepress. And the winepress is where the grapes are. So this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now what's going to happen on that day? Notice, on that day the what? The slain of the Lord will be from one end of the earth even to the other, they shall be buried, very good, very good, you're still with me, they shall not be buried or gathered or lamented. Why will they not be lamented? Because there is no one to lament them, hello, because they're all dead. All of the wicked are destroyed when Jesus comes, in other words. Now Isaiah also saw this. Notice what we find in Isaiah 24 and some verses of uh, 1 through 6. It says, Isaiah adds that when Jesus comes, He will make the earth what? Empty, Empty and make it waste. Does that sound like uh, without form and void? Absolutely. The land will be utterly emptied and utterly plundered. The inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. Now didn't we just read that all men are destroyed? So, so how can it say few men are left? Well the fact is the left ones are the righteous that survive. Amen. It's the only way that you can really interpret this verse because we know there will be no one alive after the second coming of Christ on planet earth. So this must be the remnant. And the word left, I repeat once again, is a remnant word. So when it says that one will be taken and the other one will be left, if we allow the Bible to interpret itself, the one who is left is the one who is left alive. It's the remnant that remains when Jesus comes. Now let's continue. The powerful angel from heaven binds Satan and casts him into the abyss. What is the abyss again? The earth without form and void, folks. He casts him into the abyss for 1,000 years. The result of his binding is that he can deceive the nations no more until the thousand years are what? Until the thousand years are ended. So at the beginning of the thousand years, what happens with Satan? He is bound. At the end of the thousand years, what happens with Satan? He is able to deceive again. He is unbound. Now let's read the note. Satan is bound to an earth which has returned to pre-creation chaos. How could human beings live on planet earth 
when the seas and the fresh waters are all blood, the air has the stench of the dead, the planet is in total darkness, and there is no plant or animal life. The binding of Satan means that he cannot deceive the nations, because there are no nations left to deceive. That is the binding of Satan. He cannot deceive the nations. If there are no nations, how is he going to deceive the nations? In other words, his binding has to do with the fact that the wicked are dead. So what would his unbinding be? That the wicked live again. And we're going to see that Revelation 20 says that. Now, but after the millennium, Satan will be loosed for a little while. The punishment of Satan reminds us of the fate of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. He was bound by the high priest and then taken to the wilderness where there were no inhabitants. Are you catching the connection between Revelation 20 and Leviticus 16? Very clear. You see, the devil's punishment has two stages. The first stage of the punishment, we studied Isaiah 24, remember? The first stage is that they are bound in prison. The second stage is after the thousand years when they are destroyed. So what is the emphasis of verses 1 through 3? What is the center of focus? The earth and Satan, right? Now, we are left with some questions after this first outline, this first cycle in verses 1 to 3. These are the questions that I found that I wanted to answer after reading this first cycle. What happened with the righteous during this period? Do we have anything in this outline about what happened to the righteous? No. Were they on, on earth or in heaven? Anything that tells us where they were? No. What did the righteous do during the thousand years? Anything on that? No. What do bind and unbind mean? Not directly, doesn't say. We need, to, we need more information. What happened to the wicked persons who were destroyed at the second coming? What did Satan deceive the nations to do after the thousand years? It says he went out to deceive the nations, but to deceive them to do what? It doesn't say. What happened to Satan after he was released for a little while? Was the, he was released and he was released forever? How long was he released? We don't have that information. So are we left with questions after the first outline? All we know is a lot about what's going to happen with the devil at the beginning, during and after the millennium, and we know what the condition of the earth is, is when Jesus comes and during the millennium, but we're left with a series of questions. And so now we have a second cycle. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 4 through 10. The same millennial events are going to be repeated again. We're going to start at the beginning of the millennium again. We're going to talk about the millennium again. And we're going to talk about events at the end of the millennium again. But the center of focus now is not primarily on Satan and the condition of the earth. The focus now is upon what happens with the saints at the beginning, during, and at the end of the millennium. Are you following me? Now, let's, let's pursue this. When Revelation 20, 1 to 3 ends, we are left with several questions. What happened to the righteous as the millennium began? What do the words bind and unbind mean? What happened to the wicked persons who were destroyed at the second coming? Did they remain destroyed forever? What did Satan deceive the nations to do after the thousand years? What happened to Satan after he was released for a little while? These questions will be answered in this second cycle. Now let's, uh, let's answer the questions. At the beginning of the thousand years, the righteous dead are what? Raised to life. We know this because Revelation 20 verse 4 says that they what? That they lived. And were they dead? Of course. Because John says, I saw those that had been beheaded because they didn't worship the beast in his image. I would assume that if they were beheaded, they died. <laughs> and so it says that those who had been beheaded lived. So it must be that they what? That they resurrect. And so Revelation 20 verse 4 says that they lived. And what did they do? They reigned with Christ for a thousand years on earth, right? Be real. 
how could, how could they enjoy living on earth for a thousand years? The way the earth is. This, is, this resurrection is called the what? Earth. The first resurrection. And the righteous and holy are resurrected in the first resurrection. It says in verse 6 that righteous and holy people will resurrect in the first resurrection. Now, the Apostle Paul explained that the dead in Christ would rise what? Interesting. The dead in Christ would rise first. That's the first resurrection, right? Then those who are alive and remain will be what? Caught up. Does that uh, give us an inkling of where the righteous are going to be? See, Jesus doesn't come down. The righteous go up. And you have other, other texts in Scripture that indicate this. For example, Matthew chapter 24, it says, He shall send His angels and they shall gather His elect from the four winds. See, Jesus doesn't come to be here with the elect. The elect are gathered by the angels to be taken to Jesus. In the clouds. In what are the clouds? angels. So Matthew 24, 30 and 31 is connected with this. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he speaks about our gathering to Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to take you to my Father's house. Clearly, Scripture teaches that Jesus is not come to set, coming to set up His kingdom here. God's people are caught up to meet Jesus in the air. So let's finish this here. The Apostle Paul explained that the dead in Christ would rise first, then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. What are the clouds? The clouds are the angels to meet the Lord where? In the air. Jesus does not come all the way down to the earth. Jesus promised to take His people to His Father's house. The Father's house is where? In heaven, because Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven. And by the way, God the Father is not going to come at the second coming. You know, there's this, another one of those myths that we develop, you know, that because it says that Jesus is going to come in the glory of His Father. But Jesus was on earth and His Father was in heaven and Jesus still had the glory of the Father. So the expression in the glory of His Father doesn't mean that, he's, that the Father is coming. It means that He has the glory of His Father. The glory of the Father is in the face of Jesus all the time. Are you following me or not? Amen. It says in Acts chapter 3 that He shall send forth Jesus. He's going to send Jesus to get the people of God. And then the people will ascend to heaven with Jesus and the Father and the cherubim and the seraphim and the representatives of the worlds will all be waiting to receive us just like they were waiting to receive Jesus at His ascension. So Jesus promised to take His people to His Father's house. The Father's house is in heaven because Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven. A strict reading of Revelation 20 verses 4 through 10 does not reveal that the saints will be in heaven during the thousand years. However, we will see that Revelation 21 verse 2 points out this fact very clearly. Because Revelation 21 verse 2 says that the new Jerusalem descends from heaven and it is the camp of the saints. So if it descends from heaven, it's the camp of the saints, the saints must be in it. Are you following me or not? Amen. Now, the saints were given what? Thrones. And they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Before this, they were the scum of the earth. The kings of the earth ruled over them and mistreated them and trampled upon them. But now they will be royalty. They will reign with Jesus. They will sit on His throne. Remember Jesus promised that whoever overcomes will sit with Him on His throne? And so this is the fulfillment. The saints will sit, they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Something else was, was done with the saints. Something else they're going to do during the thousand years. What is it? Judgment was committed to them. In other words, the saints are going to have a working vacation. <laughs> the thousand years will be a celebration in heaven, but it will be a working vacation because God has a task for them to perform. 
the task to perform is a work of judgment. Now let's read the note. The question is, who are the righteous going to judge? It is obvious that they will not judge the righteous, because they will all be in heaven. And it cannot be the holy angels, because they don't need to be judged. This must mean that they will judge Satan and his angels, and the wicked which were left behind dead on earth. That's the only group that they could judge. Let me ask you, have all of the righteous been judged before the second coming? Yes. Yeah, in the pre-advent judgment. All the righteous have been judged. You don't have to judge the loyal angels. They don't need any judgment. They're loyal to God. And the righteous, they're all in heaven. They're, they're performing the work of judgment. They're not judging themselves. So the only groups that are left are the devil and his angels and the wicked. Now the Apostle Paul had this straight. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, now listen carefully, uh, you know, you read Revelation 20, and it says that those who were beheaded because they worshiped the beast, his image, and received the mark, and so on, they are going to be the ones that judge. But they are not exclusively the only ones that will perform this work of judgment. It's just that Revelation is emphasizing that, that those who lived in the end time and they were killed for their faithfulness to God, they're going to judge. In other words, they're going to judge those who judge them. But the judgment is going to be performed by all of God's people, not only by those who refuse to worship the beast in his image and receive the mark. You say, how do we know that? Well, let's notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 1-3. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Who will judge the world? Saints. The saints will judge the world. What does the word world mean? Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. He that, is a, he that is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So the word world is not referring to the geographical territory. It is referring to the wicked inhabitants of the world whose focus is this world. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And then he says, do you not know, now listen carefully, do you not know that we shall judge angels? Are the Corinthians going to judge angels? So are only those who were beheaded by the, by, by the end time uh, enemies of God's people being the only ones that are going to judge? No, because the Apostle Paul says we're going to. So this judgment will be performed by all of God's saints not only by those who were beheaded because they were faithful to the Lord in the end time. Now the question is, who are the angels that are going to be judged? Just, 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 I mean, all you have to do is use common sense. They can't be loyal angels. They can't be faithful angels. Because the faithful angels need no judgment. So they must be what? They must be Satan and his angels. There's no other explanation. So the saints are going to judge the world, the wicked, and they are going to judge angels, the wicked angels. Now, let's notice uh, what it continues saying. The righteous will not be subject, subject to the second death. So the righteous don't suffer second death. Let's read the next line. The rest of the dead will not come to life again until the thousand years are ended. Now uh, the question is, who are the rest of the dead? Who resurrects at the beginning of the millennium, according to what we just noticed? The righteous. The righteous. righteous and holy is he who resurrects at the beginning of the millennium, reigns and judges. So just use your, your, the, the gray matter that God gave you and say, who then would be those who will uh, be, who will resurrect after the thousand years, when the thousand years are ended? The wicked, of course. It's just, it, it, it's, it's not conjecture, it's simple reading of the text. It is the wicked. Now, let's notice the note. This is very important. All beings in this world experience a first birth and a first life, correct? 
when the millennium begins, those who died in Christ will resurrect to their second life, or to the second stage of life, right? And they will not die anymore. Correct? Yes. The wicked, on the other hand, will resurrect to their second life, after the thousand years, will be judged, and then they will suffer what? They will suffer second death. So you'll notice that the righteous, you know, they all were born from their mothers, they lived. If they died before Jesus came, they died their first death, then they resurrected and they live again, and they don't die anymore. The wicked on the other hand, they were born from their mothers, they lived their life, they died, they resurrect, and then they're going to die the second death. So who is it that suffers the second death? The wicked. The righteous suffer only the first death, and they go through the first resurrection. Now, let's notice the next page. There is a punctuation problem in Revelation 20 verse 5. The original New Testament manuscripts did not have punctuation marks, so the translators placed them where they felt they belonged. The New King James translators should have placed parentheses around the following phrase, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. There should be parentheses there. You say, well, aren't you adding to Scripture? No, because punctuation marks were not in Scripture. Now, in effect, the New International Version does this very thing. The NIV does put the parentheses there. The parenthetical th statement breaks the flow of thought in order to explain what will happen with the wicked which were left behind at the beginning of the thousand years. Now let's go there to Revelation 20 because I want, I want you to see this. Revelation chapter 20. This is a very important point. You know the much maligned NIV has the parentheses and they belong. That's why I say you need to be eclectic in your way of using Bible versions. You can't say exclusively the King James and no more. And that it's a blasphemy to read the NIV. There are things in the NIV that are better than the King James translation. I'm not saying the manuscripts that were used were better. I'm saying that the translation sometimes is better. Are you understanding the distinction? We have to be practical. Now, notice Revelation chapter 20, and let's go to verse 6. Actually, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Wow, there you see the problem? So those who resurrect after the thousand years, that's the first resurrection, right? No, because we already noticed that those who resurrect in the first resurrection are the righteous. So what do you do? If you put parentheses around the, the portion of verse 5 that says, the, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. If you put parentheses, what is a parentheses? What is the purpose of parentheses? It is to break the flow of thought to add an explanation. And so if you put parentheses there, and you read verse 6, verse 4, and you connect it with verse 6 and leave 5 in parentheses, this is the way it would read. Verse 4 again. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Blessed and holy. This is the first resurrection. Are you with me? So you skip what is in parentheses. It's an explanatory note about the rest of the dead. Okay, I see you nodding, so that's good. Amen. Now, at the end of the thousand years, going back to our material, at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be what? Released from his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations once again. What does it mean that he's unbound? The rest of the dead live again. Notice, if all the wicked are dead during the thousand years, then Satan will have no one to deceive. 
when the wicked resurrect at the end of the thousand years, Satan will have his power base back and will be able to deceive once again. Thus the binding and non-binding of Satan is explained by the condition of the wicked. When they are dead, Satan is bound. When they resurrect, Satan is unbound. Revelation 20 verse 5 contains the key that explains the binding and unbinding of Satan. How much power does Satan have if he doesn't have any followers? None. He is bound. And when his wicked followers resurrect, he has his power base back. And so he is unbound. Notice that the host of the wicked will be innumerable, like the sand of the sea, and they will come from the four corners of the earth. The cards seem to be stacked in favor of the wicked, and the righteous appear to be in jeopardy. Now before we go to the next point, I want to say that the judgment that takes place during the thousand years is not going to change anything. There's not going to be anybody that uh, when you open the books you say, Oh Lord, this one should have been up here. The, the judgment during the thousand years is God's great audit. What does an auditor do? He cooks the books, right? No, an auditor checks the books to see if the accounting was done correctly. And so during the thousand years God is going to do an audit. And by the way, when you examine the audit you say, wow, the books were kept just right. So the thousand year judgment is God's audit. I also like to compare it with an instant replay. You know, when, when a baseball game is going on, and there's a close play at first base, and the umpire calls the individual safe, and everybody is booing, what do you want to see? You want to see the replay, to see if the umpire got it right. And so the purpose of the millennial judgment is, you see, God has called the wicked out. He says, you're out of here. And so the purpose of the judgment is to examine if the umpire got it right. And we're going to discover that he got it right in every single case. The purpose is not to reverse any case. The purpose is to show that God did everything right. Now let's continue here. The wicked surround the what? The camp of the saints and the beloved city. Uh, let me ask you, who is the center of focus here? Is it the wicked or is it the righteous? It's still the righteous. What is the purpose of saying that the wicked surrounded the city? Well, they put the righteous in jeopardy, right? So the center of focus is still the righteous because they're in the city and the wicked surround it and it looks like the righteous are going to be destroyed. The center of focus is still the righteous. Now, let's read the note. They surround the camp of the, of the saints. What happened to God's people all over the earth before the millennium now happens to God's people all gathered in one place. See, before the millennium, Jerusalem is what? Worldwide. Jerusalem is global. So when the wicked gather around Jerusalem before the second coming, uh, they're gathering around Jerusalem worldwide. Are you following me? After the second coming and the millennium, things become literal. God's people are literally within the literal city, and the wicked literally gather around the city. Do you see the principle? And so, it's so the, you know, <laughs> futurists have it wrong. They say, oh, the wicked are going to gather around little Jerusalem in the Middle East before the second coming. Uh-uh. It violates the principle. The principle is that before the second coming, Jerusalem is, is global. And therefore the enemies are global. And the gathering of the enemies is a global gathering against global Jerusalem. And then when Jesus comes, after the millennium, He comes down, then you will deal with the literal. It will be a literal city with all of God's literal saints inside. The wicked will literally gather around the city. Are you understanding the principle? Amen. Now, forgive me for getting so excited. <laughs> what happened to God's people all over the earth before the millennium now happens to God's people all gathered in one place. Jerusalem before the millennium is worldwide, where two or three are gathered in Christ's name. But after the millennium, all God's people are gathered in a literal place in the literal Jerusalem. They are gathered there at the second coming of Jesus. Satan, his angels, and the wicked will be unable to conquer the city. They will all be cast into the lake 
of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet had been cast before the millennium. So what happens with God's people? Are the wicked able to destroy them? No. So let me ask you, what is the focus of the second passage here? Do you see that it took you full circle again? What happens with the righteous at the beginning, during, what they did during the millennium, and what happened at the end of the millennium? But now we, we don't know much about the wicked, except that they surrounded the city to destroy the saints. So we need to know, did, did God show the wicked their cases? I mean, did, did God do a judgment so that the wicked could see the judgment that the righteous performed during the thousand years? Are you understanding me? So we go to the third cycle, Revelation 20, 11 to 21, verse 1. Revelation 20, 11 through 21, 1 goes over the same ground as the previous two outlines. But the central concern is with the judgment of the wicked after the millennium. After the thousand years, the rest of the dead live again. Now, this is important. At the second coming of Jesus, what appears? A white throne. See, Revelation 20 verse 11, folks, is not describing something that happens after the millennium. Revelation 20 verse 11 is speaking about an event that takes place at the second coming. Because it's taking you back to the beginning of the millennium again. And you're going to see that in a minute. At the second coming of Jesus, a white throne appears. We are told in Revelation 20 verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now let's read the note. The events of Revelation 20 verse 11 take place at the second coming, at the beginning of the millennium. Notice this event as described in Revelation 6, 14 through 17. You say, now wait a minute, uh, does Jesus at His second coming come seated on a throne? Yes, He does. He's depicted as coming on a horse. He's a conqueror, but He also comes on the throne because He's a king. Different emphases. Notice this event as described in Revelation 6, 14 through 17. It says, then the sky receded as a scroll, when it is rolled up, does the sky disappear then? Yes. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand. Does Jesus sit on a throne at His second coming? He most certainly does. So Revelation 20 verse 11 is really depicting Jesus coming and sitting on that throne. Because if you read Revelation 20 11, it says that the sky, the heaven recedes and the earth disappears. Very similar description. Now notice, Revelation 20 verse 12 then describes, this is important, now we're going to go to an event that happens during the millennium. See, the right white throne is at the beginning of the, the second coming. Now we're going to deal with what happens during the millennium. It says, Revelation 20 verse 12 says, The dead were standing before God. Which dead? The righteous dead? No, the righteous dead are already in heaven, folks. So who is standing before God? The wicked dead. How can wicked dead people stand before God if they're dead? Nope, not in verse 12 they don't. They don't they're, in verse 12 they're not resurrected. Yes! The dead stand before God through the books. Just like the righteous stood before God in the books during the investigative judgment. Are you with me? Uh, I'm going to prove it to you. So it says, uh, Revelation 20 verse 12 then describes the dead standing before God. Books are opened and another book is opened which is the book of life. And listen carefully. And the dead were judged according to the things that were written in the books, according to their works. Who was judged? Not those who were alive, the dead. So the white throne is the second coming. Then the dead are judged. And then comes the resurrection after the millennium. Ha! 
Let's, yeah, absolutely. The sequence, it's another cycle. Notice, uh, let's read the, the don't note here. This verse is describing events that take place during the millennium. It is obvious that dead people cannot stand before God personally. The text explicitly states that the wicked stood before God though they're, through the record of their lives, through their works, right? In the fourth outline we will notice what those works were that condemned the wicked. See, there's no list in, in this cycle, but in the last cycle we're going to see why they were lost. In the fourth outline we will notice that those whose works condemn them will be deleted from the book of life. Revelation 20 verse 12 is describing the judgment of the wicked dead during the millennium. But now notice, the first part of Revelation 20 verse 13 describes the resurrection of the wicked dead after the millennium. Because we are told that the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades, which is the grave, delivered up the dead who were in them. What does that mean, that, that the sea and the grave gave up the dead that were in them. That is the resurrection. In Isaiah 26 it says that the earth will cast forth the dead. A very similar expression. So you have the white throne at the second coming, you have the judgment of the dead during the thousand years, and now you have the resurrection after the thousand years. Are the wicked going to see the record of their lives when they resurrect? Notice, it's clear. Ellen White was right. And she didn't get it from a vision. She's getting it from Scripture. Notice. The first part of Revelation 20, 13 describes the resurrection of the wicked dead after the millennium because we are told that the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. According to the second part of Revelation 20, verse 13, after the wicked resurrected, what happened? They were judged, each one according to his works. So are the wicked going to see the record of their lives? Yes, they are. We know that this judgment, listen carefully, takes place on earth. Because according to verses 7 through 9, the wicked surrounded the holy city on earth. Now listen, the books, plural, contain the works of the wicked. And they are judged according to the things which were written in the books. Though we are saved by grace through faith, our works reveal whether our faith is genuine. In the judgment it will be seen that many of the wicked said, Lord, Lord, but their lives were filled with lawlessness. The book of life contains what? The names of all those who will be saved. Now why is the book of life brought out in this post-millennial judgment? Why, why, why is the book, it says books were opened and then it says another book, the book of life was opened. Do you know why? Because God is going to show the wicked the record of their lives and then He's going to open up uh, the, the book of life and say, your name isn't here. Because the last verse of Revelation 20 says, whoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The purpose of the book of life is to show them that they are not there. And the reason they are not there is because of what is in the books. Are you with me? See, we need, there's so much more in this passage than what we've seen as Adventists. We, you know, we just study and read the same old stuff that, that, that we've read time and again. And we read over and over again because we don't go to the text to study for ourselves. I don't have any divine enlightenment. I'm not more intelligent than any of you. I probably am less intelligent than many of you. But you can go to scripture and you can study these things for yourselves. Amen. But we have to invest the time and the effort and we have to pray and we have to ask the text questions and we have to search for answers to the questions. We have to be inquisitive readers. Our mind has to be engaged when we're studying scripture. In other words, don't just be reflectors of what other people have said about the millennium. Go and study it for yourself and read the spirit of prophecy. It's amazing when you read the last chapter of Great Controversy. It's all there. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Preaching to the choir, I know. Now listen, the, the note. 
the names of the lost will not be found in the book of life because of the record of their lives which was written in the books. At this point we do not know what those works were. But in the next outline we will. It is a remarkable fact that God will not destroy the wicked until they are convinced that God dealt justly with them. They will even see the record. Amen. After the judgment of the wicked they will be what? They will be cast into the lake of fire and will suffer what? Second death. Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15 reaches the same climax as had previously been reached in Revelation 20 verses 8 and 9 where it says that the wicked and the devil and his angels were thrown into the lake of fire. Now you have the same climax again, but it's the climax of the third outline. After all, there are not two lakes of fire where the wicked will be cast, there is only one. After Satan and his angels and the wicked, after Satan and his angels, the wicked, death and the grave have been cast into the lake of fire, God will make what? A new heavens and a new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Let me ask you, does Revelation 21 verse 1 belong to chapter 20? Yes. It does! After the lake of fire, then we find that God makes what? A new heaven and a new earth. In other words, the chapter division is in the wrong place. Now our time is just about up. So we're going to have to take a little bit of our next session to finish outline number four. But uh, we're going to notice in our study of the last page of this material that you have before you that the purpose of the fourth outline is to show what was contained in the records of the wicked and it is also going to show us um, what life will be like in the holy city and in the new earth. And of course we have to take a look at that and uh, so in our next session we are going to take a look at cycle number four. Have you been understanding what we've studied so far? Amen. We're going to take a look at cycle number four and then we will have a complete picture of the millennium.